There is an ongoing need for volunteers at Bethel and on theocratic construction projects. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has limited the number of those who may be invited at this time, there is still a need for volunteers. As you watch the following video, please note the spirit displayed by those who make themselves available for Bethel service. Making yourself available for Bethel service is like knocking on a door that leads to many other privileges of service. Of course, to serve at Bethel requires a self-sacrificing spirit and a willingness to serve wherever there is a need in harmony with the attitude displayed by the prophet Isaiah at Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of Jehovah saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. When Isaiah learned about an opportunity to do more in Jehovah's service, he responded eagerly, even though he did not know exactly what he was going to be assigned to do. It was enough for him to know that Jehovah was extending an invitation to serve in a special way, and Isaiah wanted to volunteer. The same spirit is shown by Bethel family members worldwide. If the branch committee determines that there is a need for your services, they will decide where you can best be used, whether at Bethel or perhaps on a theocratic construction assignment. Submitting your application may open a door of opportunity to serve Jehovah and his organization in a variety of ways. That was an excerpt from the video, Making Yourself Available for Bethel Service. If you are interested in serving at Bethel or on theocratic construction projects on a part-time or full-time basis, please watch the entire video on JW.org. Baptized Christians who are 19 years of age or older and are interested in volunteering should apply. Speak to your congregation secretary for more information. If possible, please submit your application electronically on jw.org. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where your peace was threatened? How did you handle it? We can learn much from the faithful man Jacob about how to make peace. Please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 26 and follow along as Brother Mark Sanderson, a member of the governing body, applies the lessons in the dramatic Bible reading with the theme, Jacob, a man who loved peace. Have you ever been the victim of oppression or injustice? Have you been angered by something someone has said or done? Who of us hasn't? In situations like that, people who don't know Jehovah often react in a way that's far from peaceful. They retaliate, they fight, they hit back. But we know that Jehovah sees what happened and he can set matters straight. We're wise to remember the words of Jesus. Happy are the mild-tempered. Happy are the peacemakers. The Bible describes a man who remained mild and peaceable in some extremely difficult and stressful situations. Repeatedly, he chose not to fight, preferring a course that led to peace. That man was Jacob. Jacob learned from the peaceful example of his father, Isaac. There was a famine in the land and Isaac moved his family to Gerar, which was ruled by Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Let's read about the problems that arose and see how Isaac dealt with them. Please turn to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 12. And Isaac began to sow seed in that land, and in that year he reaped 100 times what he sowed, for Jehovah was blessing him. 
The man became wealthy, and he continued to prosper until he became very wealthy. He acquired flocks of sheep and herds of cattle and a large body of servants, and the Philistines began to envy him. So the Philistines took soil and stopped up all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham. Abimelech then said to Isaac, Move from our neighborhood, for you have grown far stronger than we are. So Isaac moved from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and began dwelling there. And Isaac again dug the wells that had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, but that the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham's death. And he called them by the names that his father had given them. When the servants of Isaac were digging in the valley, they found a well of fresh water, and the shepherds of Gerar began quarreling with the shepherds of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek, because they had quarreled with him. And they started digging another well, and they began quarreling over it also. So he named it Sitna. Later he moved away from there and dug another well, but they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth and said, It is because now Jehovah has given us ample room and has made us fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. That night Jehovah appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your offspring on account of Abraham, my servant. The Philistines, motivated by envy, stop up all the wells that Abraham had dug, and the king asks Isaac to move from the neighborhood. Isaac now has a decision to make. Perhaps some encourage him to stay put. Think about how they might have reasoned. You've done nothing wrong, Isaac. Jehovah told you that you and your offspring would possess the land. You have nothing to fear. You have many servants, and they're stronger than the Philistines. Why not hit back against those who have done this to your wells? In this situation, what would you have done? Isaac chooses a peaceful course. He decides to move on. This is not easy. Isaac has many servants and flocks of sheep and herds of cattle. He has tilled the ground, planted seed, and it's produced plentifully. But he leaves that behind and moves on. But Isaac's troubles are not over. In his new location, his servants dig wells and find fresh water. But the shepherds in that area say, the water is ours. Isaac then digs another well, but the local shepherds quarrel about that one too. Again, instead of fighting over the matter, Isaac moves and finally, finds a place where he can reside in peace. Jacob saw that his father's peaceful actions had a good effect, and he knew that Isaac had received Jehovah's blessing. What's the lesson? Parents, never underestimate the powerful effect your good example can have on your children. Jacob has a twin brother, Esau. Of the two, Esau is born first, but Jehovah foretells that, contrary to custom, the older Esau will serve his younger brother. Jehovah foresees what kind of personalities they'll develop, and he knows that Esau will have little appreciation for spiritual matters. This becomes evident 
when Esau exchanges his right as firstborn for a mere bowl of stew, sealing the matter with an oath. But something more is involved. In selling the birthright, he also gives up the right to receive a prophetic blessing from his father. Years pass. Isaac has grown old, and he decides it's time to impart the blessing to his firstborn. He may not know that Esau had sold his right as firstborn. In any case, he tells Esau that he will bless him, but asks him first to provide him with a tasty dish of fresh game from the field. Rebecca, the twin's mother, overhears this conversation and persuades Jacob to impersonate his twin brother while Esau is out hunting. The plan is successful. Isaac unwittingly blesses Jacob. Esau, at learning of this, is furious. Let's take up the account from Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41. However, Esau harbored animosity against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau kept saying in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are getting closer. After that, I am going to kill Jacob, my brother. When the words of her older son Esau were told to Rebekah, she at once sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Look, your brother Esau is planning to take revenge by killing you. Now, my son, do as I say, get up and run away to my brother Laban at Haran. Dwell with him for a while until your brother's rage calms down, until your brother's anger towards you subsides and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? After that, Rebecca kept saying to Isaac, I am disgusted with my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob ever takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these daughters of the land, what good is my life? So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, saying, you must not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Go away to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take for yourself a wife, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty will bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and you will certainly become a congregation of peoples. And he will give to you the blessing of Abraham, to you and to your offspring with you, so that you may take possession of the land where you have been living as a foreigner, which God has given to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he departed for Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Jacob's parents tell him to travel to his uncle, Laban, to find a wife. Of course, the core issue is the problem with Esau. Recall that earlier, Isaac had a problem with the Philistines, a problem that evidently could not be settled peacefully. So what did Isaac do? He moved on. Now Jacob faces a similar situation. His brother is seething with anger. So Jacob leaves. It means leaving his home and his family. It means making a long journey to a distant land. Jacob could have chosen to stand his ground. He owns the birthright. He could argue the matter with his father and mother. I'm no child. I'm 77 years old. Jacob does none of those things. The Bible simply says, Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and departed. What's the lesson? When we face a situation 
that can't be settled peacefully. We probably won't need to flee for our lives to a distant land. Sometimes, however, it is the course of wisdom to walk away from a situation. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 14 says, Beginning a fight is like opening a floodgate. Before the quarrel breaks out, take your leave. While Jacob is on his way to his uncle, Jehovah appears to Jacob in a dream and assures him of his support and protection. That does not mean that Jacob's troubles are over. At the journey's end, he moves in with his uncle's household. In time, a situation arises again that shows that Jacob is a man who loves peace. Let's read about it from Genesis chapter 29 and verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger, Rachel. But the eyes of Leah had no luster, whereas Rachel had become a very attractive and beautiful woman. Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel, so he said, I am willing to serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. To this, Laban said, It is better for me to give her to you than to give her to another man. Keep dwelling with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. But in his eyes, they were like just a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give over my wife, because my days are up, and let me have relations with her. With that, Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. But during the evening, he resorted to taking his daughter Leah and bringing her to him, that he might have relations with her. Laban also gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a servant. In the morning, Jacob saw that it was Leah. So he said to Laban, What have you done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why have you tricked me? To this Laban said, It is not our custom here to give the younger woman before the firstborn. Celebrate the week of this woman. After that, you will also be given this other woman in exchange for serving me seven more years. Jacob did so and celebrated the week of this woman, after which he gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Besides, Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her servant. Jacob has reason to be upset. He had arranged with Laban to work seven years for Rachel. At the end of the seven years, a wedding feast is arranged, but the heavily veiled woman brought into him is not Rachel, it's Leah. Imagine how shocked Jacob must have been. Instead of admitting to his deceit, Laban gives an excuse. What thoughts come to Jacob's mind? Does he consider that Jehovah might be working out his promise to make Jacob's offspring plentiful, like the dust particles of the earth? We don't know. As it turns out, Leah bears him six sons, including Levi and Judah, family heads of the two most honored tribes of Israel. Of course, Jacob couldn't have foreknown this. Still, Jacob, the peacemaker, accepts Leah and goes along with Laban's outrageous request that he work an additional seven years for Rachel. What's the lesson? It's disappointing when others don't hold to their agreements. Like Jacob. Can we find it in our hearts to forgive and find a way to preserve peace with them? 
Jacob serves Laban for 14 years for his two wives, and he works for Laban another six years for a flock of his own. Finally, at Jehovah's direction, he gathers his family along with his animals, and without informing Laban, he leaves for home. When Laban learns of this, he is furious. He chases and catches up with Jacob. This is a dangerous situation, one that can easily turn violent. Imagine how it might have been. Jacob had come to a mountainous region. Possibly it's morning and the air is cool. There are the sounds and smells of animals, sheep, donkeys, camels. There are many. The servants attend to them, getting them ready for the day's journey. But then come cries of alarm. Laban has come and he's not alone. He arrives with strong men. They gallop in on camels. They dismount. This is not a friendly visit. Laban's men are ready to obey orders from Laban. Jacob's servants quickly gather to the scene. All eyes are fixed on Laban and Jacob who argue. The previous night, Jehovah had warned Laban in a dream to be careful about what he'd say to Jacob. Still, Laban is angry and aggressive. Laban makes two charges. First, he says, why have you resorted to outwitting me and carrying my daughters off like captives taken by the sword? Why did you run away secretly and outwit me and not tell me? The answer to that charge is obvious. Jacob replies, it was because I was afraid, for I said to myself, you might take your daughters away from me by force. Laban also charges that Jacob has stolen his household gods. Rachel has indeed stolen the gods, but Jacob knows nothing about this. A search is made, but the idols are not found. Jacob then makes his defense. Let's take up our reading at Genesis chapter 31, and verse 36. At that, Jacob became angry and began to criticize Laban. Jacob then said to Laban, What is my offense? And for what sin are you hotly pursuing me? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your house? Put it here in front of my brothers and your brothers, and let them decide between the two of us. During these 20 years that I have been with you, your sheep and your goats never miscarried, and I never ate the rams of your flock. I did not bring you any animal torn by wild beasts. I would stand the loss of it myself. Whether the animal was stolen by day or was stolen by night, you would demand compensation from me. By day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and sleep would flee from my eyes. This makes 20 years for me in your house. I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you kept changing my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the one whom Isaac fears had not been on my side, you would now have sent me away empty-handed God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, and that is why he reproved you last night. Then Laban answered Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, and the children, my children, and the flock, my flock, and everything you are looking at is mine and my daughters. What can I do today against these or against their children whom they have born? Now come. Let us make a covenant, you and I, and it will serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone 
and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brothers, Pick up stones. And they took stones and made a pile. After that, they ate there on the pile of stones. And Laban began calling at Jigarse Hadutha, but Jacob called it Galiad. Laban then said, This pile of stones is a witness between me and you today. That is why he named it Galiad and the watchtower, for he said, Let Jehovah keep watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters, and if you start taking wives in addition to my daughters, though there is no man with us, Remember that God will be a witness between you and me. Laban went on to say to Jacob, Here is this pile of stones, and here is the pillar that I have erected between you and me. This pile of stones is a witness, and the pillar is something that bears witness, that I will not pass beyond this pile of stones to bring harm to you, and you will not pass beyond this pile of stones and this pillar to bring harm to me. Let the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the one whom his father Isaac fears. After that, Jacob offered a sacrifice in the mountain and invited his brothers to eat bread. So they ate and spent the night in the mountain. However, Laban got up early in the morning and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. Jacob had served Laban faithfully for 20 years, even though Laban had defrauded and exploited him. Laban doesn't acknowledge that, but rather dishonestly claims that he is the rightful owner of all that Jacob has with him. Laban then suggests that they make a covenant of peace, ensuring that neither family will bring harm to the other. Laban's motive is not that he loves peace. It might have been to ensure that Jacob will not return with the household gods after Laban's death to deprive his sons of their inheritance. In any case, Jacob agrees. Everyone relaxes. There's to be no violence. And a monument is set up to memorialize the agreement. Despite the many years of oppression, Jacob agrees to a covenant of peace. He does not harbor resentment or seek revenge. That crisis is over for Jacob. But now, another one looms. Jacob sends messengers to his brother. They say that Jacob is returning and that he seeks Esau's favor. The messengers return with the news that Esau is on his way to meet him, and with him are 400 men. Oh my! Is Esau still angry? Understandably, Jacob is worried. He does not want to fight with his brother. Let us see how he handles the situation. Please turn to Genesis chapter 32 and verse 13. And he spent the night there. Then he took some of his possessions as a gift for Esau his brother, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 female sheep, 20 rams, 30 camels nursing their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 full-grown male donkeys. He handed them over to his servants, one drove after another, and he said to his servants, Cross over ahead of me, and you are to set a space between one drove and the next. He also commanded the first one. In case Esau, my brother, should meet you and ask, To whom do you belong, and where are you going, and to whom do these ahead of you belong? 
Then you should say, to your servant Jacob, it is a gift sent to my Lord, to Esau. And look, he himself is also behind us. And he commanded also the second, the third, and all those following the droves. According to this word, you are to speak to Esau when you meet him. And you should also say, here is your servant, Jacob, behind us. For he said to himself, If I appease him by sending a gift ahead of me, then afterward when I see him, he may give me a kindly reception. Jacob wants peaceful relations with his brother. He sends a generous gift, hundreds of animals, to help make that possible. Was Jacob weak-minded, too cowardly to stand up to his brother? Not at all. Why, as the time neared for the meeting with Esau, Jacob wrestles with an angel until dawn to receive further assurance of Jehovah's blessing. Let's now see what happens when the two brothers meet. Please turn to Genesis chapter 33 and verse 1. Now Jacob raised his eyes and saw Esau coming, and four hundred men were with him. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph behind them. Then he himself went ahead of them and bowed down to the earth seven times as he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, and he embraced him and kissed him, and they burst into tears. When he raised his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, Who are these with you? To which he said, the children with whom God has favored your servant. At that, the female servants came forward with their children and bowed down. And Leah too came forward with her children, and they bowed down. Then Joseph came forward with Rachel, and they bowed down. Esau said, What is the purpose of all this camp of travelers that I have met? He replied, in order to find favor in the eyes of my Lord. Then Esau said, I have a great many possessions, my brother. Keep what is yours. However, Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, you must take my gift from my hand, because I brought it so that I could see your face and I have seen your face as though seeing God's face in that you received me with pleasure. Take, please, the gift conveying my blessing that was brought to you. For God has favored me, and I have everything I need. And he continued to urge him so that he took it. What a happy outcome. Instead of an angry confrontation, there is a joyful reunion. The two men shed tears. They embrace. Again, Jacob is the peacemaker. How did he prove that? He prayed, and he acted in harmony with his prayers. He sent gifts. He showed honor and respect to his brother, calling him Lord and bowing seven times. What's the lesson? Doesn't this account well illustrate the extent to which we should be willing to go to preserve peace with our Christian brothers and sisters? We learn so much about seeking peace from Jacob. When threatened by his brother while living at home, he moved away. When deceived by Laban regarding Rachel and Leah, he yielded. When chased down and accused by Laban, Jacob agreed to a covenant of peace. And when confronting Esau, 
he offered a gift. Keep in mind, in none of these situations was Jacob the one who needed to apologize. Yet throughout his life, Jacob loved peace. He relied on Jehovah, and Jehovah blessed him. Jehovah never forgot Jacob and how he pursued peace in his dealings with others. When we do the same, when we pursue peace in the face of injustice, in the face of persecution, in small issues as well as in big issues, Jehovah will not forget us either. Jehovah will richly bless us if we love peace just as Jacob loved peace. How comforting it is to reflect on Jehovah's love and support for those who make peace. This Bible account is filled with practical examples that each of us can imitate. You will be pleased to know that the dramatic Bible reading, Jacob, a man who loved peace, is now available for download on the JW.org website and in the JW Library app. How can we maintain our God-given peace despite living in an ungodly world? Please pay close attention to Brother David Schaefer, a helper to the teaching committee, as he answers this question in the talk, The Result of True Righteousness Will Be Peace. Earlier, we considered the expression at Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That is, the tranquility and calmness we enjoy because we have a close friendship with Jehovah. What a remarkable blessing. But although we enjoy God-given peace, our life in this system of things is not problem-free, is it? Psalm 34, 19 acknowledges as much when it says, Many are the hardships of the righteous one, but Jehovah rescues him from them all. We may experience family opposition, persecution, war, natural disasters, or severe illnesses, but none of these hardships can separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor governments, nor things now here, nor things to come, none of these things can rob us of the peace Jehovah gives. And yet, there is something that can. Please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. And as we read this text, notice that it refers to peace as a result. Do you think of peace that way, as a result? If peace is a result, what causes it? Isaiah 32, 17. The result of true righteousness will be peace, and the fruitage of true righteousness will be lasting tranquility and security. What a beautiful expression, lasting tranquility and security. Again, from what does it result? True righteousness. What if righteousness no longer mattered to us? What if a person concluded, it makes no difference how I live or what sacrifices I make. If I'm going to suffer hardships either way, I might as well do whatever I please while I can. What's wrong with that thinking? Would it show appreciation for peace and all that Jehovah has done to make it possible? Peace is a result, and behind every result is a cause. If we want peace, we have to pursue righteousness. An unrighteous person cannot be at peace with God. Serious transgressions put a strain on a person's relationship with God. Recall King David's words found at Psalm 38, 3. Sensing Jehovah's disapproval, he wrote, There is no peace within my bones because of my sin. 
Inevitably, the unrighteous person will reap what he sows and lose his peace. What is righteousness, and how do we pursue it? Righteousness is what we have or what we show when we do what is right according to Jehovah's standards. And those standards are not just rules we follow, but principles that guide the way we deal with each other. As universal sovereign and creator, Jehovah God determines what is righteous. Isn't that what was represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and bad in the Garden of Eden? As a result of Jehovah's command to abstain from its fruit, that tree represented God's right to determine for his creatures what is good and what is bad for them. And although Jehovah has given humans free will, the right to choose, he has not granted humans, not even perfect ones, the right to set the standard for what is righteous and what is not. Now notice once again that Isaiah 32, 17 says that the result of true righteousness will be peace. It uses that term twice, true righteousness. Not everything called righteousness is true righteousness. Many people view righteousness as just a, a personal virtue achieved by following the rules. At Matthew 23, 28, Jesus said that the Pharisees appeared righteous on the outside, but inside they were lawless. Ecclesiastes 7.16 talks about those who think their standards are more righteous even than God's. And at Romans 10.3, Paul talked about people who seek to establish their own righteousness. But false piety, over-righteousness, and self-righteousness are not what Isaiah 32.17 is talking about. Today, many argue for the acceptance of conduct that Jehovah forbids. They may even find support from a world already alienated from God. But wide acceptance in a growing community does not redefine righteousness. None of that is true righteousness. Our loving Creator sets the standard for what is right, not our feelings, not the community at large. Now, while you're here in Isaiah, uh, please turn to chapter 48. In order to be viewed as righteous, we have to trust that Jehovah should set the standard of right and wrong. In addition, we must prove by our speech and actions that we agree with Jehovah's standards and obey him. And that takes real courage in a wicked world. But when we do that, we enjoy the result. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 48, verses 17 and 18. This is what Jehovah says, your repurchaser, the Holy One of Israel. I, Jehovah, am your God, the one teaching you to benefit yourself, or as the footnote says, teaching you for your own good, the one guiding you in the way you should walk. If only you would pay attention to my commandments, then your peace would become just like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Paying attention to Jehovah's commandments results in two things. First, our peace will become just like a river, serene, abundant, ongoing. Second, our righteousness will be like the waves of the sea. Remember your last trip to the beach? As you stood there on the shore, or perhaps on a high hill overlooking the ocean, watching the waves roll in one after the other, just as they have for thousands of years, could you feel a sense of constancy? Jehovah says that our course of doing what is right can be just like that. He will guide us in the path of righteousness. He will bless us with unending peace. In the process, we learn through experience how Jehovah's wise and loving ways truly benefit us personally. But if we refuse to do that, we learn what agitation and discord truly mean. As verse 22 says, there is no peace, says Jehovah, for the wicked. It's not a heavy-handed threat to manipulate human behavior as if Jehovah needed to do that. It's a fact, a truth, 
a timeless principle. God is love. He teaches us for our own good. And the result, if we pay attention, is peace. Isaiah 48, 17 and 18. And these verses assure us that imperfect humans truly can have a righteous standing with God. Let's explore that further. Do you recall the very first time the word righteous is used in the Bible? Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 6. Now, you likely recognize this as the account about Noah. Noah lived in an extremely wicked world. During his lifetime, rebel angels left their assignments in heaven, materialized, married human women, and fathered hybrid offspring who became violent giants. Now, how did all of that wickedness and violence affect Jehovah? According to Genesis 6, 6, his heart was saddened, which is a remarkable thing to contemplate, isn't it? Jehovah's feelings are affected by our decisions because he cares for us. Now, that ancient world became so wicked that Jehovah decided it must be destroyed. And yet, right in the midst of all this depravity, Noah showed a different spirit. Notice what it says at Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. This is the history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. There it is. And why was he described as righteous? He proved himself faultless among his contemporaries. Yes, Noah was not like the rebel angels or their offspring or like degraded human society. Noah walked with the true God. And thus, the second time we find the word righteous is at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. After that, Jehovah said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, because you are the one I have found to be righteous before me among this generation. Because of Noah's righteousness, he and his family survived the flood to worship Jehovah on a cleansed earth. And after the waters subsided and the family emerged from the ark, they witnessed a splendid sight, one never before observed, a serene, multicolored arch in the sky, a rainbow, a reassuring indication of peace with God, peace resulting from righteousness. And where does the word righteous appear next in the Bible? In the account about Abraham, notably in his famous conversation with, jo with Jehovah found at Genesis chapter 18, where Jehovah promised Abraham that if he found as few as 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom, he would not destroy that city. Now, what was it that distinguished Abraham as righteous in that moral climate? As you read Genesis chapters 12 through 22, you get the sense that Abraham was a man of great faith, unwavering faith. He was ready to do whatever Jehovah asked of him. Now, citing Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 and other texts, James 2.23 says that Abraham put faith in Jehovah, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he came to be called Jehovah's friend. Jehovah's friend, peace with God, resulting from righteousness. Now, what about God's people today? Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Jehovah refers to Noah and Abraham as righteous, but what would he say about you and me? Well, notice what it says toward the end of this chapter, Isaiah 60, uh, verses 21 and 22. And all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. 
They are the sprout that I planted, the work of my hands for me to be beautified. The little one will become a thousand, and the small one a mighty nation. I myself, Jehovah, will speed it up in its own time. Yes, prospective members of the great crowd have been declared righteous as friends of God, as Abraham was. In Jehovah's eyes, they are, as it says in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, dressed in white robes. Today, they're serving alongside God's spirit-anointed ones who are declared righteous for life. Jehovah, our repurchaser, the Holy One of Israel, has bought us back from bondage to sin and death through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And thus, with faith in the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ, imperfect people are considered righteous in the sight of God. Now, in calling us righteous, Jehovah God, by means of Jesus, has done something for us that we could not do for ourselves in our imperfect condition. But does, does that mean that we can do no wrong? No, it does not mean that. In order to maintain our peace, we must cooperate with Jehovah. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 1. Now, like Noah and Abraham, we live in a wicked and violent world where we are exposed to a spirit of disobedience. Satan wants us to become part of this world by adopting its unrighteous standards. In the world, sexual immorality is practiced without shame. Homosexuals flaunt their conduct. But Jehovah tells us that homosexual acts are unrighteous. God specifically warned the Israelites against this and other forms of, of immorality. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22 says that homosexual acts are detestable. Does Jehovah still find it so offensive? Well, notice what he inspired for both Jews and non-Jews in the Christian Greek scriptures here at Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. That is why God gave them over to disgraceful sexual passion. For their females changed to the natural use of themselves into one contrary to nature. Likewise, also the males left the natural use of the female and became violently inflamed in their lust toward one another, males with males, working what is obscene and receiving in themselves the full penalty which was due for their error. So, Jehovah has not changed. According to the Creator, homosexual acts constitute disgraceful, obscene error. Some would disagree. As verse 28 points out, such ones do not consider it worthwhile to acknowledge God. But with what result? As it says there, a disapproved mental state, just the opposite of peace. And merely approving of unrighteous conduct displeases Jehovah. Notice how this is indicated in verse 32. Although these know full well the righteous decree of God that those practicing such things are deserving of death, they not only keep on doing them, but also approve of those practicing them. Still, we do not hate individuals who practice unrighteousness, nor do we judge them. On the contrary, we share the good news with them. We remember that we were all born with the same infirmities and have the same sinful tendencies. But we also have the same inherent spiritual need. And thus we recognize that others can have the same peace, the same privileges, and the same prospects we enjoy if they pay attention to Jehovah. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says that God's will is that all sorts of people should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of truth. And people practicing all manner of unrighteousness have accepted the truth. That is what some of you were, 1 Corinthians 6.11 says. So we communicate impartially with all our neighbors, but we hate unrighteous conduct, and we refuse to compromise Bible principles. 
Now, sometimes moral issues become the center of heated political debates. We avoid getting drawn into such controversies. But now, in practical terms, what might that look like? In the following video, notice how adults can respond effectively when questioned on highly controversial issues. There you are. Did you both get the email survey I sent? And you're both coming, right? I must have missed it. I was on calls all morning. What's this about? Well, the whole office is leaving early. We're going downtown to support the march for gay rights. She won't go. Why? It's against her religion. Some of her people came by my house, and when I asked, they said your church won't support gay marriage. Irene? It's true. As Jehovah's Witnesses, we hold to the Bible standard on marriage, which is only between a man and a woman. And we remain politically neutral. That's such ignorant thinking. I understand it's a sensitive subject. I have a daughter who deserves her rights. Trust me, Amber, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we believe everyone has a right to choose how they live and I would never force my beliefs on anyone. But you won't go. Just as I would never force my beliefs on you, all I ask is the same respect. And no, I won't be going. I have to go back to work. Look, obviously, Irene, I don't agree with your perspective. But I do appreciate that you're not pushing it on anyone else. Thank you. In contrast with the majority of mankind who are divided, true Christians are united. We loyally support Jehovah's right to rule. We don't set the standards, and we're not trying to solve the world's problems on our own. We fully support God's kingdom. Now, as we observed in the video, moral and political issues might be brought up in the workplace. But more often, our young ones, even very young ones, are confronted with these same topics. How will they respond? Are your young ones ready? As you watch the next video, notice how Olivia defends Jehovah's righteous standards. Great discussion today, everyone. Remember, midterms of this Friday, no excuses. That includes you, Jordan. You were noticeably silent during our discussion today, Olivia. I was. I guess I just didn't have much to say. Aren't you concerned about gay rights? Um, well, it seems like a political issue, and, and I stay neutral when it comes to political stuff. But it's not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. Hey, Mr. Dallas? She's like crazy religious. Hey, th there's nothing wrong with that. No, you don't understand. Jehovah's Witnesses hate everybody that isn't straight. That's not true. We don't hate anyone. I've spoken with your people before. They seem big on equality. We are. The Bible says God isn't partial, so we believe that everyone should be treated fairly. Good. So I assume you have gay members in your church? Mm, no, we don't. But I thought you just said everyone should be treated equal. I I'm confused. Ah, called it. Jordan, don't you have a class to get to? As I was saying, how is that not a little hypocritical? Saying that you love everyone and then excluding certain people. Honestly, Mr. Dallas, I wonder the same thing. Okay. And? Well, I researched it in the Bible, and I realized that God accepts all people, but He doesn't accept all conduct. 
what does that mean? It means that you can't be abusing drugs, you can't be stealing or being violent and still be a witness. There's just certain actions that God just doesn't accept. Including how someone expresses their sexuality? In some cases, yes. We follow God's standards, not having sex without being married. Well, if that's how you feel, that, that's your right. Personally, it seems a tad archaic to me, but to each their own. Hey. Hey. Does the Bible really say all that? Yeah, it does. Okay, maybe you could show me sometime. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So we can expect future installments in this saga. But did you notice how Olivia was able to defend Jehovah's righteous standards? She kept her peaceful spirit, didn't she? She acknowledged that she had the same question as the teacher, but she had done further research on the subject. And did you appreciate how she subtly showed that Jehovah's standards benefit both the individual and the community? As examples, she highlighted the avoidance of drug abuse and theft, values she knew her teacher would appreciate. Parents, are your young ones able to explain why we do or don't do certain things? Do you know how your children really feel about Jehovah's standards? Are they obedient simply to avoid making you mad? If so, will that truly be enough? Encourage your young ones to prove to themselves why Jehovah's standards are wise. Help them to see how they can explain their choice to live by Jehovah's standards. Teach them how to resist pressure to follow the world. We are so thankful that even during these critical times, hard to deal with, we can enjoy the inner peace that Jehovah gives to the righteous. But let's remind ourselves of what Jehovah promises to bring about once Satan's unrighteous system is removed. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 37. Here in these familiar verses, we find a beautiful description of what is to come. And notice once again how the Bible makes the correlation between peace and righteousness. Psalm 37, 29. Do you have it? What does it say? Who will possess the earth? The righteous. And for how long will they live on it? Forever. And then according to verse 11, what will they find there? Peace. The result of true righteousness will be peace. And how much peace will they find? A little peace? Just personal or family peace? Remember, the righteous already had peace with God even when wicked people still existed. But what will Jehovah provide to all those who continue loving him? The abundance of peace. And how will you feel about that? Delighted or exquisitely delighted? So stick with it, dear friends. During this convention, be on the lookout for the connection between peace and righteousness. Continue on the course of righteousness. Help others to find the way of peace. In that way, we can enjoy peace with Jehovah now, throughout the remainder of these last days, and on into the future when Jesus rules as king over a cleansed earth in which the righteous will flourish and peace will abound. Thank you, Brother Schaefer, for helping us to understand why upholding Jehovah's righteousness is essential for enjoying true peace. We have been well instructed 
during this first session of our convention, haven't we? We look forward to our next session, in which we will consider in greater detail promises of peace found in God's Word. We will also see how Bible principles can help families to enjoy greater peace now and how we can avoid pursuing imitation peace. Now let's conclude this session by singing song number 97 entitled, Life Depends on God's Word. After singing the song, you may have your local concluding prayer. Again, that's song number 97. Thank you. 